What's up, everyone, and welcome back to the Mega Theorem Club podcast. As always, I'm here with Zach and Spencer to share with you some fascinating creatures we wanted to shed some light on. We have decided to do a mini-series on symbiosis. We have been primarily discussing one organism at a time, but we are switching it up a bit. Symbiosis is when two organisms interact and live in close physical proximity. This is usually to benefit at least one of the organisms. There are three main types of symbiosis, mutualism, commensalism, and parasitism. Now, as you will see today, that both species do not have to benefit from this close interaction. And today we'll be discussing parasitism, and I will let Zach tell you what that is. Yeah, thanks, Sean. So, parasitism is a relationship between two organisms in which one, the parasite, lives in or on the other, which we call the host, having a negative impact on the host's health and having a positive impact on the parasite's fitness. And this is distinctly different than predation. There's a quote from the entomologist E.O. Wilson on how this is sort of different than predation, where obviously the predator benefits while the prey is negatively affected by that interaction. But E.O. Wilson says a parasite eats its prey in units of less than one. So I don't know why, (laughs) but I I just kind of thought that was a really funny way to think about that and wanted to include it. But yeah, it, that it's essentially what it is. A parasite is very slowly feeding off of its host, little by little, and usually keeping them alive the whole time. I don't know if any of you chose a parasitoid to talk about today, but we've talked about them on previous episodes. And I think a parasitoid sort of, kind of, it, it blurs the line between keeping their host alive and just like killing them in the end. But yeah, not really sure why, I just kind of thought that quote was funny. That is pretty cool. And it's the most like nerdy way of thinking. About it. <laughs> yeah, yeah I think that's what was so it. funny about it. It was like, <laughs> who, who thinks of that? Who, who thinks of eating like a hamburger in units of less than one and calling yourself a, a parasite of that hamburger? Well, now I am. <laughs> well, if we think about humans as parasites to cows, because we eat, say, a hamburger, that's not a full cow. But that, we're also killing cow? the cow to make that hamburger and just, like, That's dispersing true. that okay. among a bunch of people. Gotcha. Okay. Yeah. Then you could argue that lions are parasites of gazelles. and Yeah. yeah. Just, <laughs> just because they share their prey doesn't, doesn't mean it's still alive. I think overall, between the different subunits of one, it still adds up to one. <laughs> yeah. Have you ever read the yeah. book The Road? No. It, it there are it, that's that that's the like post apocalyptic yeah yeah thing? yeah okay. well, so so in it i mean it's it's the end of the world people are crazy uh there are, there are some cannibals but it, they uh they don't kill their prey or i guess not at first so they you know they'll chop off a leg keep the person alive so for a while they might fall under the parasitism but eventually they do kill them <laughs> Mm-hmm. The, the the main character just comes across a horrific scene that scarred me since i read that of just like limbless people kept alive by cannibals that is really creepy i don't know how they would keep them yes. alive but that's really i think they're just like bur- burn the crap out of their severed oh, limb like and cauterize, cauterize the it, artery yeah. and just like i don't <laughs> they weren't thriving i would say <laughs> <laughs> yeah well as we'll find out not all of the the hosts that I talk about today really thrive either. Yeah. Um, oh, we should probably do, in case you're kind of grossed out by stuff, um, trigger warning. Multiple <laughs> Post, today. <laughs> posthumous trigger warning for limbs. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Po- posthumous. Yeah. There. <laughs> yep. <laughs> okay. Very good. Love it. All right. Let's go. <laughs> yeah. So uh, the example of parasitism that I chose today is a parasitic relationship that I'm sure all of our listeners are familiar with to one degree or another, especially if you live on the East Coast or the Midwest of the United States and definitely like literally everywhere else, but like mostly those places. And I am specifically talking about the black legged tick Ixodes scapularis. Uh, People are familiar with this tick because, as a result of its life cycle, it's the main vector of Lyme disease in humans in the United States. 
And as a part of my last job, I actually studied the life cycle and transmission of Lyme's disease to humans. So believe me when I tell you that it's complicated. But I'll do my best to distill this down and try to try to be coherent and understandable. So these ticks, as adults, have eight legs because they are technically arachnids, meaning they're related to spiders, which I, I, I get, but it just seems weird to me. I don't, I don't know why that one seems weird to me. But when they're the size of a sesame seed as larva, they only have six legs, which kind of, I don't know, that, that's just another weird part of their life cycle. Like, ticks are just weird. Mites also follow that life cycle, right? Oh, probably. I think I, I would be willing to bet that mites and ticks are more closely related than ticks are to spiders. Yeah. If that makes sense. Because they're all arachnids, technically, so they're all sort of related to each other. But I bet I'd be willing to bet ticks and mites are pretty closely related. They even look pretty similar. Yeah, they do look really similar. I actually, I don't think I actually know what the difference is. Like, from a, from a phylogenetic standpoint. There, there are predaceous mites, but yeah, a majority of them do feed on plants. Uh, plant matter okay so ticks are like specifically just parasites yeah okay well that's kind of cool to know learn something new every day well okay i gotta just make a quick plug when i studied abroad in tanzania there were red velvet ticks or velvet uh, not ticks mites excuse me velvet mites red velvet mites and these things were probably a good they could be up to like a half inch long holy shit ick and they look exactly like a giant version of the red ticks that you might see on the the sidewalks in the Midwest, uh, but they're but they're obviously huge, and they look like they're made of velvet, and they were just kind of everywhere. And I'd never seen a mite that big. Kind of strange to look at. I don't think mites usually get that big. Like usually they're not even visible, right? You could see them on plants. Well, yeah, but if you're not looking for them, then you're not going to see them. You're not going to notice them, I guess. Yeah, but like a half inch. Might that's pretty noticeable. Yeah, in areas where these ticks live, which is kind of a, a lot of Africa and southern Asia, you know, in the warm parts, they actually are a food source for some people. <laughs> which oh. I can't imagine having mites as a food source since the <laughs> ones we have are microscopic. I just don't like the idea. Like it's it's kind of making me crawl a little bit. <laughs> Eating a velvety mite. <laughs> yeah, I don't know about the texture, but I, I imagine it's probably like a gusher. Ooh, that doesn't help. That's not, that's not <laughs> helping. <laughs> I'm glad we did the trigger warning. <laughs> 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 okay. Anyway, back to ticks. <laughs> but yeah, yeah, back to ticks. At the start of their life, like I said, they got six legs. They're like the size of a pinhead. And they're almost impossible to see unless you're very specifically looking for them on a white sheet to make them stand out. Even though they kind of look like a speck of dirt. But like a lot of parasites, black legged ticks actually go through a couple of different hosts throughout their life cycle. Which is a really common thing with parasites. At an early stage, they'll have some sort of host that transfers them to the next host as part of their life cycle. At this early larval stage... They usually latch on to mice and other small rodents. They'll take a blood meal and swell up like the tiniest little balloon you've ever seen. And when I was working with them, they swell up so much, they sometimes they just pop. Like, they literally just pop because they're so big and ballooned. But they'll swell up before they fall off, and then they'll molt into a nymph, and they, now they have eight legs. It's just a weird, weird thing. They sprout two extra legs. I guess like mites, apparently. These nymphs are still not as big as a sesame seed, even though they are a little bit bigger than the larva. Like, at least you can kind of see them now. The nymph life stage still usually infests smaller rodents, but it can occasionally bite onto larger mammals like deer and even people. And then it takes another blood meal, falls off again, and it molts again into the now sesame, si sesame seed sized adult. Say that, say that five times fast. Sesame <laughs> seed sized Oh, that was actually easy. Um, <laughs> that was only once, though, Zach. You have to do it five times. <laughs> sesame seed size. Sesame seed size. Ses ah, okay. Okay. Moving on. Yep. Moving on. There you go. I think I've said it five times total. Now, this adult actually targets larger mammals like you and me. It's not just occasionally latching onto a person. Like, it's targeting people. It's going up. 
they passively wait on the end of like a piece of grass and just wait for you to walk by, stick their their four legs out and just latch on to you. It's it's really creepy to watch. But yeah, again, they'll balloon up to like 10 times their original size as adults. They it's really gross to see. Not going to lie, I want to tell you to look up a picture, but don't. It's disgusting. So they fall off and then they lay their eggs and start the life cycle all over again. Their life cycle usually takes about two to three years, actually, depending on the climate of your region. They'll lay eggs, they'll hatch and be larva, but then it's like another year after that that they actually become adults and, and do their thing. This is a parasitic relationship because they're essentially stealing your nutrients. And although one or two of them might not really be a big deal as far as stealing your energy or how you feel... Like, a lot of times you're just not going to notice that they're even there until you accidentally scratch one and you're like, oh, oh, hey there, I got a, I got a tick embedded in me. But there is a much bigger deal that can happen when black-legged ticks bite you, and that deal is Borrelia burgdorferi. This is the bacterium that causes Lyme disease, and according to the CDC's website, typical symptoms will include fever, headache, fatigue, and then a characteristic skin rash called erythma migrans, or otherwise known as the bullseye rash. When a tick bites you, that site becomes irritated, and if it's got Lyme disease, it starts to develop in this circular rash with two rings around it, sort of like a bullseye, like the Target logo. And then if let untreated, this infection can spread to joints, your heart, and your nervous system, and could eventually kill you if you don't get it taken care of. But the weird thing is, ticks aren't even born with this bacterium. It's not vertically transmitted from the parent to the offspring. Tick larvae are born sterile, so to speak, at least in terms of Lyme disease. Problem, at least for us, comes when larvae take their first blood meal, probably from a mouse, and mice, specifically paramiscus mice, act as a reservoir for the bacteria Borrelia burgdorferi, meaning that these mice are just carrying this bacteria around. It doesn't really impact their health, at least not noticeably to us. But Which just, mice are these? I think it's Paramis paramiscus. Deer mice. Yeah. Paramiscus maniculitis. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, paramiscus maniculatus. Don't they, aren't they also known for another disease? Haunta virus? Yes. Um, yeah. Haunta. Yeah. yeah, that's... Yeah. Yeah, that one's... <laughs> you don't want Hanta. Just don't hang around these mice. I got a quick thing about Hanta virus. Did you so have I did, Hanta? Uh, I know. <laughs> no, no, luckily not. Uh, <laughs> but I was doing... To to. Right, exactly. I did a, a... I took a mammalogy class in the Northwoods of Minnesota where there's a lot of deer mice, and that was a lot of what we were studying. And we were trapping them, you know. But how you get Hanta is not from the mouse biting you, or anything, but it's from when their pee essentially dries and then becomes aerosol, like it flakes off it as dust, and then you breathe that in. That's how you actually get hantavirus. And, you know, so we're working around traps that are full of mouse pee and poop, and, of course, it dries up, and then, you you know, you're changing traps twice a day. And we were, like, halfway through the, through the course, and the professor's like, oh, by the way, I'm supposed to, like, tell you about this disease that you could get from working with mice deer mice it's called hantavirus if you get it you'll probably die and we're like this seems important we should probably should have taken precautions and then we learned that most hantavirus cases are not found in minnesota or really anywhere east of like the rocky mountains and most of it is found in california so he's like less than a less of a percentage of chance of getting Hanta virus in Minnesota, where if we were in California, we'd be wearing respirators. Yeah, Hanta is more of like a, a Western Southwest disease, or at least that's where it's most prevalent. When I lived yeah. in Utah working for uh, Neon, we actually trapped for mammals in Moab in like Southern Utah. And we would mm. we would test them like they would take blood samples and we would test them for Hanta. And some of them did come back positive while I worked there which is kind of weird to think about. Scary. Like we weren't <laughs> hanging out with their pee or anything, but yeah, it was just right. crazy to think about like come in contact with it more than, more than you would expect. There was a, a conference that this professor told us about that specifically was about paramiscus related research projects. And 
one of the things that they were doing that they were actually testing the researchers as they came in for Hanta. And they did find out that there was like two people that attended the conference that had Hanta virus in their blood. Like why? Yeah, was it at like, the conference. They yeah. were sick with it or they just had antibodies from having it in the past? They had, I, I'm assuming they were testing for antibodies. So at one point they had Hanta virus. I don't know exactly what came of it. I just remember hearing about it. That's so. crazy. I know there's like different strains of it. Some are more virulent than others. Maybe you can get it. And like some people getting COVID just never know. <laughs> you just never know you right. have it. Yeah. And I think that was the case for those two researchers. They just, they were perfectly fine. They just didn't know they like had gotten it at one point and that's why I lucky, I guess. So anyway, uh, <laughs> that was a good sidetrack, I guess. <laughs> uh, we'll continue back with, uh, with your stuff. Zach. Yeah. Anyways, <laughs> these ticks aren't born with Lyme disease. They have to latch on to a mouse that is infected with Lyme disease. And basically they pick up the bacteria and the bacteria sort of moves into the tick's salivary glands. When the tick molts and it it falls off, you know, when insects molt, basically everything is shed, right? Down to their trachea (laughs) or tracheoles and even like insides get shed when they molt. But... I guess the salivary glands, they don't. They just keep growing and they don't get shed off when the ticks molt. So the bacteria is kind of allowed to to stay in the salivary glands. And when they're adults and latch onto humans, that's how we get Lyme disease. So it's kind of a, it's a really convoluted process from like no Lyme disease to finding a mouse reservoir that has it, picking it up from the mice falling off, and then coming and getting us to give us Lyme disease. With climate change making everything warmer and wetter, especially in the Midwest and in the East Coast, the conditions for ticks are just perfect now. And populations have been exploding in the last decade. And this means that people are having a lot more run-ins with ticks, leading to skyrocketing rates of Lyme disease, and it's becoming a huge problem. As a, a Minnesotan myself... Growing up in the Midwest, Lyme disease wasn't unheard of when I was growing up. We always had to do tick checks and everything if we went hiking, but actually getting it was pretty rare. But now I know several people that have had Lyme's disease, and it's hard to find somebody that hasn't either had it or knows somebody that had it. Problem is even worse on the East Coast with eight of the top 10 states that are reporting numbers of Lyme disease cases being on the East Coast with New York reporting 16,800 cases in 2022 alone. Oh my God. Like it's, (laughs) it is everywhere. And Minnesota, I think was number eight on that list. I did notice once I moved to North Carolina, their ticks were everywhere. You couldn't you couldn't walk into like grass without getting them and I was sitting on my concrete pad like garage thing and just watched a tick skitter across the concrete. I was like, <laughs> "You're not even waiting. You're you're chasing me right now. You're 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 actively pursuing me. This is crazy." <laughs> I'll get into that later actually because that was probably not a black-legged tick if it was moving around no. that much. Probably a lone star tick and I'll get into those later. Those are um... Uh, just just as bad, if not worse, than black-legged ticks. But talking about black-legged ticks... Oh, yeah, I was just about to get into those, actually. So, black-legged ticks, like we're talking about, are not the only ones out there either. Lone star ticks and winter ticks are also exploding. These ones can be really nasty. And I'm not currently aware of winter ticks transmitting diseases to people, but lone star ticks can give you alpha-gal syndrome... Which, Sean, probably does not affect you at all because you're a <laughs> vegan. Yep. <laughs> so <I want> <laughs> you can, yeah, you can get all of the Lone Star ticks that you want. But if you get Alpha Gal syndrome, if you're not a vegan, you're going to run into problems because it's essentially an allergic reaction to red meat. There's people that can literally die because they're having a reaction to eating red meat and. What what kind of reaction is that? I'm totally blanking on that word. Anaphylaxis. Yeah, they go into so anaphylaxis like, yeah. because <laughs> this red meat just destroys them. It messes with alpha gal in some way. I used to know the mechanism behind it, but I I've long forgotten that one. Yeah, I think essentially it just puts your immune system into hyperdrive for certain proteins in the red meat. Uh, but I asked, did didn't Kevin have this in our lab? 
Kevin Chase. Ah, uh, yeah, I think you're right. I think yeah, I think he I did think, have it. Like he couldn't eat I red think he meat. He had it for a little Some, while. Yeah, and it was we knew somebody he, that it, had it lasted it. like a year or something like that. Some crazy amount of time. Oh, it can last for like five, six years. Wow. And if like okay. if you try to test eating red meat before it's gone. It basically just like starts over. Resets it resets it. the timer. <laughs> One, you go into anaphylaxis. Two, you got another six years again before you can even try eating red meat again. I just give it up. Just give it up. Just become yeah. a vegan. Yeah, or, or vegetarian. I mean, eat chicken or fish. <laughs> yeah, there's or, options before vegan. You, know, you got <laughs> options. You don't need steak. I mean, most most people like a, a good steak or a burger or something. So be careful of those. I've also seen pictures of Lone Star ticks infesting deer literally by the thousands. And they like to get all up in their ears, around their eyes, and it gets really nasty. And so where you and I getting a couple black legged ticks isn't going to do much to us if it's not infected with Lyme disease. When you get that many ticks on you, you start to notice it. And there have been cases of deer that have straight up died from blood loss because they're getting so many Lone Star ticks attached to them and draining them of blood, which is just so gross to think about. I I, I sat through a talk where they showed pictures of moose. That's what I was just about to talk about. Oh, I'm sorry. Yeah, yeah, you ruined it. (laughs) Okay, maybe we can cut it out. Cut it out. <laughs> nope, nope. Staying in. It's all staying in. I was just about to talk about winter ticks affecting moose populations. So one of the guys I work with is from Maine, and he actually told me about winter ticks because I was I was talking about black-legged ticks. One, side note, he said last year he got a tick that he had embedded on him. He got it tested, which you can do. If you get a tick, you can send it to a lab in Connecticut you can send it to, and they'll test your tick for diseases. And he said the tick that he gave them that was embedded on him tested positive for both Lyme disease and babesiosis at the same time. Luckily, he found it soon enough that he was able to get it off of him, so he didn't get either. Oh my what god! What is that other disease? Yeah, what is it? what is babesiosis? Honestly, it's just another disease that is carried by by ticks. <laughs> yeah. Uh, <laughs> no when way. I was, when I was doing work on them, there was like the same list of ten diseases or something that black legged ticks can carry. And I kept looking up, I, I forgot, literally every time I would read a paper, I was like, oh, wait, which one is this? So I can never remember what each of them does, but Babesia is another bacteria that can be carried by ticks. According to health.newyork.gov, many people who are infected with Babesia microti, sounds like a dick joke, feel fine and do not have any symptoms Some people develop nonspecific flu-like symptoms such as fever, chills, sweats, headaches, body aches, loss of appetite, nausea, or fatigue. So it just kind of sounds like generic sick. (laughs) Yeah. Yeah. (laughs) Uh, But it can also lead to a special type of anemia called hemolytic or hemolytic anemia, condition where your red blood cells are destroyed. Oh, my God. (laughs) That sounds awful. So... Don't get babesiosis or Lyme's disease. Both of them sound awful. Yeah. But anyways, back to the moose. Moose populations in Maine and all along the East Coast are getting destroyed by winter ticks because they are infesting moose at such high levels that if you're under a year old, essentially... Like you straight up die from blood loss because you're just not big enough to fend them off yet or at least survive the level of blood loss you're going through. I have a question for that. Obviously, they're taking a lot of blood, but at what point is it maybe just like the immune system is just so overactivated because, you know, ticks inject saliva into us and our immune system can fight that. And at what point is it maybe the immune system is in overdrive to the point where it kills you rather than blood loss? That's a good question. I don't I don't know. I always just thought it was straight up blood loss, but it's probably a combination of the two. Yeah, because I wonder, like, your body maybe goes into shock and then you go into you know, blood loss shock. I don't know. I don't know what the steps are, I guess. But. Yeah. I do know that parasites like ticks and stuff have a lot of mechanisms basically to disguise themselves. Our bodies are really good at determining whether something is a part of us or a part of something else, right? 
That's basically how our immune system works. Ticks are actually really good at being able to inject their mouth parts into us, but also being able to hide from our immune system. So maybe it's actually not making our immune system go into overdrive. Right, right. Because they they are pretty good at disguising themselves. So I don't know. It could is probably a combination of the two. Because your immune system right. will figure it out at some point. <laughs> That's what my thought was. Is okay. Maybe you have two, and you didn't notice they bit you because they might have like a little bit of anesthetic in their in their saliva, and then has that ability to keep the blood from clotting. But when you have ten thousand ticks, I can't imagine your body's like, huh, everything seems to be working. <laughs> yeah. This yeah. is ideal. This is this is good. <laughs> this is fine. Lovely. Yeah, that's kind of my tick story. Oh, what I was going to say about the tick that was crawling across your driveway, Sean. Black-legged ticks are a passive hunter, I guess. They kind of just hang out on the end of a blade of grass with their legs out, wait for something to come by, and they'll latch onto it. Lone Star ticks, on the other hand, are active hunters. They chase their prey down. Oh, that makes Hmm. sense. They're so fast, too. Do we know the mechanism behind that? Like, is their, is their eyesight good? Are they following heat signals, CO2 signals? It's probably a combination of heat and CO2 signals that yeah. they're chasing okay. down. But they're so fast. <laughs> <laughs> but, uh, yeah, on that note, that's what I got about black-legged ticks. Yeah. I wanted to go back in time a bit and find an example of parasitism that can be observed in the fossil record. We often think of parasites as organisms we see with the naked eye, such as ticks, lice, Bed bugs, even. Yes, these are small, but you can see them easily enough. Some parasites are smaller than the width of your hair, though, and this includes the parasite I want to talk about, Trichomonas. This is actually a genus of parasites found in humans, birds, dogs, and cats. Actually, I learned today other animals, so this list is not all inclusive. They make up a group of parasites called anaerobic excavates, which means they inhabit anaerobic environments or low to no oxygen. And excavate means they are unicellular eukaryote organisms, so some of the most basic forms of life. They are previously considered to be in the protista kingdom, but that has recently changed, and I don't want to go down that path because that was new to me did you guys know that the protista kingdom isn't a thing anymore no when was that i I don't know i i started to go down that and was like this is a bit beyond what i wanted to talk about so i skipped it (laughs) but uh for now uh we'll we'll consider them protists they are considered basal flagellates which means they have a flagellum a whip-like appendage that they use to move around trichomonas are one-celled organisms about 10 micrometers in size and for comparison human hair is around 50 micrometers in diameter and they move around whipping this long appendage like a propeller getting from place to place I am no microbiologist, so the basis on how these creatures live is a bit beyond my expertise, but what they can do once in the body of a host is quite gnarly. Again, a disclaimer, there are some gruesome bits coming up. You can skip ahead or stay here to find out more, but uh, you've been warned. (laughs) (laughs) And so I wanted to compare this to malaria real quick. Malaria is a parasite in the bloodstream and attacks red blood cells in order to replicate or reproduce, if you will. Trichomonas will infect different areas of the body depending on the exact species and what the host is, but a few examples are the GI tract in dogs and cats, the upper GI tract in mouth and birds, the mouth in humans, and also the urogenital tract of humans. They meet this definition of a parasite because they live in close proximity, uh, literally inside these animals that are you know, our pets, our various birds, and even us, and survive off the nutrients our bodies provide it at a detrimental cost to us or the animal host. They can survive outside the body for various lengths of time, depending on the species, but ultimately they need a host's body to thrive and continue on. They attack the host cells and use the nutrients to multiply through binary fission. Imagine one of these pear-shaped single cells simply splitting into two nearly identical looking units just straight down the middle. Just something out of like an alien movie. Not alien where they blow out at the host. Just one slime becoming two slimes. So, so what does it look like if these animals or us have this parasite? I want to start with dogs and cats because that's probably the least gruesome. Cats tend to get it more than dogs and they often get it when there's like a lot of cats confined in close quarters where it can spread easily from one animal to the next. 
In these pets, the parasite attaches to the intestinal epithelium wall and incites an inflammatory response. And the most common symptom is diarrhea, which is, allows more trichomonas to be released for the other animals to pick up through ingestion. Medical help is suggested to help your cats and pet, uh, your dogs get rid of these nasty parasites. And before I move on, I did learn today through a coworker that trick can also infect other animals like cows. And if you are a raiser of cattle, you know that it impacts the birth weight of calves if you know the mom has it. In humans, it is important to note that the Trichomonas tenax is the species that is found in the oral cavity, while Trichomonas vaginalis is a species found in the genitals. T. vaginalis is, it is an STD and can cause a number of symptoms ranging from redness and itching to a foul smell, painful sex, urination, burning, itching, all that fun, nasty stuff. I'm not here to talk about sex education. <laughs> Just please be aware of this because I do not ever remember learning about this one growing up. Did you guys know about this? No. <laughs> I guess it also goes by just the uh, trick. Watch out for trick. Uh, how common is it? I didn't look up the stats. Um, I asked someone at work and they're like, yeah, I've heard that. Cows get it. And I was like, no, I meant like, have you ever heard humans getting it? And they're like, oh, no. Yeah. Hmm, interesting. Is this the same as the thing that call causes trichinosis in like bears and stuff? Uh, tri trichomoniasis, I think. I don't know if we're just pronouncing it differently. Uh, I'm sure it could be in other animals. I My list wasn't all-inclusive. I don't know what that disease looks like in bears. It I could be. It just looks like worms in the meat, basically. Like, bear oh. hunters need to worry about it a lot because oh, shoot yeah. a bear and then it's got Is that not just tapeworms? No, it's not tapeworms. I don't think it's tapeworms. It, it's its own thing. And it's worms in the flesh of the bear. Well, these things are like microscopic. Oh, okay. Then probably something different, just very similar name. Yeah, but I don't know. Just be aware of this, folks. Sex education a little bit. Uh, I do not... I, don't, I, I never learned this growing up. The, the symptoms of trick in humans, I think, tend to affect women more so. The parasite can impact your pregnancy and also just opens you up to be more easily infected by other diseases. So stay safe and know that your partner doesn't have to be symptomatic to pass this along. I really did not tend to get into this side of the parasite until I dug it up, but I couldn't not say something once I learned it. It felt like it was a bit of a public service there. So watch out for trick and the itchy dick. And then, you know, that's what I'm going <laughs> to... I'll just leave it there. Words to live by. <laughs> that needs to be on some sort of like bump <laughs> yeah go to the hey, megatherium we... club podcast merch store and find your <laughs> sticker the, today for the, for the official sex education <laughs> sticker watch out for trick and itchy dick there we go okay beautiful the other animals this parasite is known to infect today that i looked up are various bird species it can be referred to as frounce when observed in birds of prey and canker in birds such as pigeons and doves the species is Trichomonas gallinae, and in birds, symptoms include necrotic lesions in the upper digestive tract, mouth, and throat. This leads to difficulty swallowing, regurgitation, weight loss, lethargy, respiratory distress, and overall weakness. It just sounds really awful, these lesions in the mouth. Oddly enough, pigeons and doves can be asymptomatic, but can act as carriers to other birds. One solution to this is drugs and antibacterials but you know n not everyone's out there catching birds of prey treating them for their diseases or just you know everyday pigeons that don't have symptoms i don't know if i have scared everyone away from this episode yet or not if you're still here awesome but if you remember when I started talking, I said I wanted to talk about a parasite that was known from the fossil record. Well, recent research has scientists believing that the damage left behind from trichinomus species can be seen on some of the most famous fossils in the world. Do you guys have any guess to what I'm talking about? I, uh, you just triggered a memory. <laughs> I, rem I think I remember talking about this. Um, in an episode or just with like other people other people okay, okay. definitely other people because we have not talked about this my guess is going to be sue the t-rex though the one that yep. me and Damn. sean he... saw without spencer <laughs> yeah oh yes that's where i that's where i yep you're right i remember reading about it when i saw sue by myself without you guys yep that... uh, <laughs> with my partner and you were yeah. you were just there so that makes sense 
they probably would have had a little blurb about it. But yeah, you mm-hmm. guys are right. I am talking about Sue the Tyrannosaurus Rex. Oh, no way. <laughs> what? <laughs> no, I, yeah, I, you're right. I was making a joke. I didn't think that was going to be right. No, no. Yep. Yeah. And I actually like had a little note. I wanted to remind Spencer that Zach and I have seen it together without him. But thank yeah. you. Thank you. <laughs> yeah. Go drink a pseudo Sue. Get some trichinoma. <laughs> Just kidding. Ooh. We we have no beef with pseudo Sue. I actually love it. it don't you don't get trichinoma. That you don't want that. Just get a pseudo Sue. <laughs> she is one of the most iconic T Rex fossils. I should note Sue isn't the only T Rex with signs of this parasite. The Pex Rex uh, say that ten times fast. Go, Zach. Pex Rex, Pex Rex, Pex Rex, Pex Rex. Okay, okay, he's pretty good at tongue twisters. Well, this this one was found in Montana, 1997. It also shows these symptoms. And I, I mean, there could be other skulls, but these are just the two that I, I am aware of. But it shouldn't be a huge surprise since birds are dinosaurs. And it is easy to imagine trichinomus evolving over the years to be able to infect similar species. But what does this look like in the Rex fossils? If you look at the skulls of these two mentioned T-Rex, you can see several holes in the bottom jaw. They're smooth, about an inch wide, and extending about half an inch into the bone. Originally, it was thought these holes were from bites from other, you know, other rexes or even a bacterial infection, but the holes are too neat and too smooth to be caused by teeth, and these holes actually align much better with what trichinomus can do in birds. These holes would have been the sites of the lesions that I mentioned in the bird symptoms but to have this amount of damage done the lesions would have been quite advanced if they were going from the flesh into the bone and penetrating about half an inch and at that point sue or the pex rex was suffering incredibly imagine these giant lesions of rotting flesh that are going into your jaw and the, this waxy substance where you just have massive canker sores but on an increased scale probably not very fun to have scientists even suggest that this might have been the cause of the demise of sue you know this is probably why she died he she they pretty interesting to think that one of the mightiest land animals was taken down by such a tiny organism in birds these lesions spread through the skull and through the skin which can cause a lot of issues in the head in general apparently this parasite can also cause the formation of waxy growths in the throat and it all just sounds horrible probably what took down sue And in 2020, more research was being done on Sue by Kirsten Brink, who went deeper into these trichosoma hole, if you will. (laughs) And (laughs) scientists knew that Sue... (laughs) <laughs> that Sue had three really strange teeth. They're, they're small and weird. Two were actually fused together, and the third had extra serrations, as in not, you know, where they should be, but on the smooth side of the teeth. And I guess these teeth are described as squished and bent, almost wave-like texture running down the sides, almost as if they were icing being squeezed through a piping bag, which was a quote by Brink. Brink came to the conclusion that these lesions and waxy growths caused by trichomonas could be the cause of these goofy teeth. Now, birds today, you know, they don't have teeth, so we, we can't, like, compare for sure that this was caused by trichinoma. The T-Rex, like sharks, would have continuously replaced teeth, so a couple weird teeth wouldn't be a big deal. But if the tissue around the teeth is messed up, forcing these teeth to come in all snaggle tooth like that's just a permanent toothache. Again... Probably just led to the downfall of Sue and couldn't eat, you know, it's it's got a permanent sore throat. It was just rotting away from the mouth. It's just, it's pretty horrific to imagine, but that's probably how she went out. Yeah, that's, that's crazy. <laughs> uh, I remember reading that little thing about it and yeah, I had the same thought as how can something so small take out something so massive? And I wonder how long it took. Yeah. Uh, I feel like to drill down through half an inch of bone, <laughs> that takes a long time. So uh, Sue was definitely not doing well for, I can't even imagine, years at that point. I don't know. Yeah, I, Easily uh, years. Yeah. I don't know how fast it like makes a big difference in a, a bird, but yeah. It, yeah. I mean, I'm I'm imagining the various art forms of T-Rex right now where, I mean, sometimes they make like a zombie T-Rex or whatnot. And that's just like, like, with the the jaw just half decomposed at this point, you mm-hmm. know, in the in the artwork, and that's just kind of how I imagine 
Sue's lower jaw was just kind of being eaten away. And they, they would have passed this amongst each other, like through eating. So if a, a, a yeah. Rex was eating on a corpse, then another Rex came along and ate on it, then you would have picked it up that way. They, they weren't making out. They couldn't pass it that way. You don't know that. <laughs> <laughs> I don't. I wasn't there to witness. I can imagine it being difficult. There, there's the big <laughs> argument of whether or not they had lips. Maybe they, maybe mm. they could have used those lips to smooch each other, P- pucker up. Sue. <laughs> <laughs> but that, that is the T Rick in the T Rex. Oh, Love it. Uh, I was wondering because yeah, you told me earlier. You're like, I'm doing one from the fossil record. And I was like, okay, <laughs> where am I going with talking this? about cats and dogs? <laughs> like we're still around. Sean. <laughs> I don't know what you're talking about. Yeah. I didn't see it going in the direction of Sue, but in all honesty, I'm stupid for not realizing that you would have somehow f- figured out a way to bring up Sue. Congratulations on that. <laughs> I, that's a challenge now is how many times in an episode can you relate something back to Sue? Yeah. yeah I'll be curious to see what you do for the next. <laughs> and then the, so. the running trope is how we make fun of Spencer for not being there. Yep. With us. Yep. And at this point, it'll never happen um, <laughs> because the trope has to stay alive. It can't happen so. now. <laughs> yeah. yeah, yeah, good. Uh, okay, well, I'll get into mine. Uh, if you've made it this far, congratulations. We're going to take a break from things that are going to infest you or potentially infest you. With a word from our sponsors. With our word. <laughs> Just kidding. <laughs> yeah. Is this at what point do we get sponsorship from Creams? For itchy what? trick, it, it, <laughs> what? exactly. <laughs> I thought you, you were going to go with something there. like athletic greens <laughs> or something. <laughs> oh no! Just we're we're only going to be uh, all about itch creams here at the Mega Club. <laughs> anyway, so Zach, you mentioned that parasitism <laughs> is usually something that is found on or in some sort of host. Well, the the one I chose isn't necessarily in or on, but maybe right next to and surplanting something else. So I wanted to talk about brood parasitism. Oh, I like where you're going. I was inspired by this from a comic, and I have to look up the name of the comic again here. It is Natural Habit, uh, Habitat, Habit, Natural Habit Animations. Anyway, you can find them on TikTok and Instagram and stuff, but they do a lot of like funny animal themed cartoons essentially oh i know what you're talking one about on, i've seen these too yeah yeah they have one on brood parasitism that came out recently and so I, I was thinking about that when doing this idea now what brood parasitism is it's a fascinating reproductive strategy uh, in various animal groups including insects fish but made famous by bird species where individuals will lay their eggs in the nests of other birds relying on the new foster parents to raise their own young. A lot of what we think about with brood parasitism are cuckoos, which is the bird that's in that comic that I was kind of referring to earlier, or that animation. But I'm not actually going to talk about cuckoos today, in a way. I'll get a little bit into that. But brood parasitites in general kind of have to be masters of deception, employing a suite of tactics to ensure the success of their parasitic breeding strategy. And a lot of this comes down to what they refer to as aggressive mimicry. And that can happen at various life stages of a bird, including matching the color and size of an egg, or as a chick, matching the vocal calls of the other chicks in the nest, up to fledging. And in the case that I'm going to talk about today is uh, actually the adult stage of aggressive mimicry. But essentially, all of these kind of have to be played at in order for the foster parents to be tricked into raising the young of a different species. And the first step in successfully reproducing for these brood parasitism birds is actually getting the chance to lay an egg in the nest of another bird. And so that brings me to my specific example today, which I'll talk about the African cuckoo finch and its host, the tawny-flanked Prinia, is I believe how you say that, and then the third species, which I'll talk about in a little bit. I mentioned that cuckoo birds kind of dominate the brood parasitism kind of idea, but cuckoo birds fall into their own family, Cuculidae, under their own order, Cuculiform. Cuckoo finches are not true cuckoos, nor are they true finches. (laughs) While they share the order of Passiformes, which include all perching birds, including finches, they do fall into their own family, the Duodae, which are just the family of cuckoo finches. They're found in Africa mostly, I think actually only found in Africa, 
So they're not cuckoos, they're not finches. <laughs> but now back to the cuckoo finches. So in order to get into the nest, they have to be quick and they have to be stealthy. One way for them is to look like something harmless, to not look like a cuckoo finch. So females over a long period of time, they essentially were selected to look a lot like just a harmless other species of bird that you might find in that area. And so this third species I'm going to talk about just a little bit is the southern red bishops. And essentially, females evolved to look like the females of what I'll just refer to as bishops from now on to trick the tawny-flanked prunea into saying, hey, I'm not like anything harmless. I'm not this brood parasite you've been fighting against for uh, millions of years, however long these things have been around. However, males look nothing like red bishops because they have no need to enter the nest. So there's no need for males to trick the host species. Wait, why did they choose to look like, I guess not choose because that would imply <laughs> intent. Why did evolution? Like, yeah, why bishops? I think it's because similar sized birds essentially kind of, they don't stick out. They're, they didn't give an explanation as to why. This is my own speculation. I think it's mainly because similar sized birds and there's enough of them in that area. There's enough over, overlap within their essentially ranges of the birds that it makes sense for the, for them to do this one species of bird. Probably because their nesting sites are pretty close, maybe in the same tree species. And well, actually, there's a lot of open grassland. So I think it's just a combination of they're there, they share habitats, and there was probably enough similarities that it was a good jumping start. Just like an a easy, place to an easy transition. Kind of go. Yeah, an easier transition than, say, some cuckoo birds have, like, true cuckoos have evolved to look like raptorial birds so that their host birds stay away, thinking, I'm not going to, I don't want to get eaten, so I'll leave my nest in the presence of this bird that isn't actually going to eat me. So instead, it's like, hey, you know, at once was your harmless neighbor, still is your harmless neighbor, but I'm going to look like them to make it seem like. Now, if everything goes right, once the egg is laid, then the foster parents will essentially raise the parasitic offspring or foster children. Usually the foster siblings, the host species bird in this case the prinia offspring they seemingly disappear from the nest <laughs> they're just there one day and then gone the next in very rare cases does the foster child the cuckoo finch is actually raised to adulthood with at least one other like prinia that that can happen to where at least one true offspring survives but in most cases not dissimilar to most brood parasitic birds is that parasitic offspring will kill the real offspring of that bird and so when that happens essentially the fitness of the parents is zero and cuckoo finches have a pretty consistently high rate of parasitism i don't know how they defined high maybe comparing it to other organisms i didn't look super far into the into the literature but at 19%. So 19% of Prinia nests in this given area will probably be parasitized in some sort of fashion. So this paper that I was looking at, the author was Feeney and some others, by the way, showed that these birds are locked in an evolutionary arms race. The selective pressures for the cuckoo birds to mimic this third species, this third harmless species, the red bishops, worked for a while, but the Prinia have finally caught on to their game. And they did this really cool experiment where they controlled for different types of birds encountering other different types of birds while they were in their nests. And they were looking at specifically the red bishops, the cuckoo finches, and the different sexes of those. Essentially, the prinia are aggressive to both other species, the red bishops and their actual parasites, the cuckoo finches, the females, though. They don't show any signs of aggression towards the male cuckoo finches. So it's just the females that mimic the, the red bishops. And they're aggressive, so they will chase them out. They will fight them if they have to. That's really cool. That's kind of like... I don't know, you know the scenario where there's the good guy plus their evil twin and you have a gun and you have to decide <laughs> in that moment which one to shoot. So you just shoot them both. <laughs> yeah, you just shoot, shoot them both. And that's exactly pretty much what they do. But what they also do in addition to essentially, yeah, shooting both of them is if they notice, uh, if a prinia notices that there are cuckoo finches and proper red bishops near their nest, they will actually start to reject eggs in the nest. And one other thing that they looked at through experimentation, so they controlled for this, 
the difference in color and size and other things, but mostly color. The more different an egg color was, the more likely it was to get kicked. So like you're shooting, you're shooting your friend, their evil twin and your kids <laughs> <laughs> and your and your kids. Yeah, they don't necessarily get rid of all of the eggs. though. They get rid of the ones that see the most different. An unfortunate side effect is if a prenia is in the presence of a red bishop. Well, that means that if it's if it's a true red bishop, there's no parasitism going on in their nest but they think there is. So they will actually still reject some of the eggs in their nest. And that occurred in about 12% of experimental <laughs> nests. So 12% of the time when they were shown a red bishop bird, something that you know is actually harmless to them or harmless to their fitness, they still rejected egg. And scientists were like, oh my gosh, like what is there? There's gotta be so much strong selective pressure to reject eggs that it actually happens when nothing actually occurred. They they didn't really understand why that was going on. It's really costly to reject eggs because you could reject your own eggs, but the selective pressures to reject eggs is still higher and has been working. So then kind of overall, the question is why parasitize nests? Why be a parasitic bird? And then in turn, why be defensive against that? So when a bird doesn't have to raise its young, and all the work that goes along with raising young, like building a nest, feeding, defending the nest, that is a lot. And that can take up a lot of time and a lot of energy. And so if you can just huck your offspring onto somebody else, then you can essentially reproduce more. And I couldn't find the exact number of eggs that cuckoo finches lay compared to their host's prinia, but I did find another paper that was talking about tropical generalist bird parasites in a given breeding season can lay up to 100 eggs while their hosts can have up to 40. So, so many more eggs than their hosts are having with the idea that some of them probably will get rejected, but by having so many more, you increase your chance that some of your offspring will survive, go into adulthood to, con to continue that cycle. And then the other part is why defend? Well, like I mentioned earlier, essentially, in most cases, all of the foster child, the parasitic child, survives into the adulthood and kills off a lot of the other things. So if you accidentally allow or tricked into raising it, it's really costly to your genetics and the killing of your own offspring can happen before you even notice and then you're screwed essentially. Even if you don't notice at all and then you know they become fledglings and then adults and they fly away. But the selective pressures to defend are really strong because it works and in this case, even though there was higher accidental rejection of their own things at 12%, they still were getting rid of about 60% of the cuckoo finches eggs when they did this egg rejection defense mechanism. So they were actually getting rid of over half of the amount of parasites that they would have if they didn't do that, which is strongly selected for. And the argument in this paper, the final conclusion was that in this case, while at one time these cuckoo finches were winning this arms race, it's now switched and that the prinia are actually currently the winners of this evolutionary arms race against the cuckoo finches. They were kind of speculating as to what might happen next. And there's been more evidence that instead of being as these stealthy birds that will try to like sneak into the nest, that they will swarm a nest in hopes that they can get an egg inside there. And so there's still selective pressures on both sides. And the scientists were like, we're really excited to see what happens, but we won't see that happen because that will take a long time. <laughs> but, you know, the, the future brood parasite scientists will enjoy all of this. So, yeah, that's uh, nothing gross there. That's what I found. That's what I wanted to talk about, something a little unique that was inspired by a cartoon that I saw on TikTok. So <laughs> That's I a like great it. one. I'm I'm curious, though, about why the cuckoo birds and, and these cuckoo finches get rid of all of their, I guess, foster siblings. Because a parasite's life cycle is so intertwined with its host, and it needs that host. It depends on that host for its own survival and reproduction that I feel like yeah. Getting rid of all of your future hosts would be detrimental, if that makes sense. Yeah, so I think the idea behind that is, one, not every nest of a host will be parasitized. And a good majority of them probably won't be. I mean, 19% was was high, according to these scientists. So that means about 81% are not parasitized, and that's 81%. That's a good enough stock to keep the thing going. 
But the reason that they kill a lot of the other offspring is that usually these parasitic birds are bigger than the host birds and they need more food in order to raise. But they also need to get it faster so that there's less of a chance that they're noticed that they are this <laughs> this other species of bird. So that they're bigger, they need to grow faster than all their siblings. So the easiest way to do that is to just get rid of your siblings or your <laughs> fake adopted siblings, I guess. <laughs> That's awesome. So. <laughs> So when we were in California catching bumblebees, I remember we caught a couple of cuckoo bumblebee species. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I, I don't know the answer to this, and I'm wondering if either of you two know, but do they kill their foster families, I guess? Or do they just passively, innocently get raised by a different hive of bumblebees and then go on their way? So that was one thing I actually looked up as well. And there was a special term that they had for specifically cuckoo bees. And they are brood parasites, but they might fall under, what's the term, ecto ectoparasites or something like that, where they aren't necessarily taken care of. No, uh, ectoclepto. Oh, they're kleptoparasites. Ectoparasites is like a tick that latches to the outside. Yes, yeah. But yeah. Klepto. Yeah, I was trying to pull that from my memory from the other day. But anyway, kleptoparasites where they steal the the extra food from other things. They're not necessarily taken care of. I mean, I'm sure they are to some extent. But in order to, again, outcompete the others, they're actually stealing food rather than just like accepting all the food that they get, which I think some scientists were arguing that it makes them a little bit different than these other ones. Is that cuckoo bees um, or cuckoo bumblebees? Because there are cuckoo bum differences. Oh yeah, I mean, I, I just think that cuckoo bumblebees, but yeah, bumblebees you are were, also but I, bees. Well, because cuckoo bees are no, I, cuckoo bumblebees. It would be cuckoo bumblebees. Okay. Yeah, cuckoo bees are the other thing. Yeah, because so. the, the the larvae would be raised by the non parasitic bee. Like the yeah. host. And yeah. I know that parasitic bumblebees have more of a stinger. Hmm. So I feel like they would like be ready to attack. So either they were taking out other, I don't know, competition, or they were defending themselves as they laid their eggs in there. I, I guess I'm not too sure, but I know they were more prepared for like battle. Yeah, I, I don't know the specifics as to that. I just remember reading about specifically more of the offspring side of things, not necessarily how they get yeah. get there. Yeah. And like, I don't know the answer either. I'm just, I was just curious. Either way, brood parasitism. It's kind of cool. Definitely not as gross as your guys. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, we, you chose a good one. <laughs> thank you. Thank you. Yeah, I was kind of in debate and then I saw that comic and I was like, well, the things were aligning. And then I was reading a journalism article on brood parasitism and they mentioned this cuckoo finch and I... You know, and then they cited the paper and they had a link to the paper. So I was like, oh, I'm just going to read that. And I actually really enjoyed the paper. And so I was like, well, I'm just going to focus on this. Because at first I had all these examples of all these different birds. And, you know, I had ducks and I had cuckoos of all different types of species. And I'm like, but nope, the idea is to focus in on like one type of thing. I'm getting way too into the weeds here. So I'll just focus on the cuckoo finch because I think it's now you know, I'm going to have a favorite brood parasite. I guess it would be my favorite brood parasite. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. There's so many examples of parasitism too with like within every kingdom, I guess. We talked about protists. We talked about eukaryotes. We talked about brood parasites, but there's also plant parasites too. Plants that parasitize other plants. That was a, that was a cool awesome. episode. I think, yeah, I agree. I'm excited for next. Um, next is mutualism. Yeah. And then we'll follow it up with commensalism. And yeah, so be looking forward to that. And as always, if you have any suggestions, clarifications, corrections, uh, kind words, negative words, I guess, if you want to. <laughs> Feedback uh, of any please sort. Please reach out to us. Yeah. Feedback of any sort. Please reach out to us. We're most available through our email, megatheriumclubpodcast at gmail.com. Again, I think we say this every episode. We'll try to be more on social media. We have an X or formerly known as Twitter. Um, I think there was like We have, we have nine? one follower other than me. Oh, perfect. Okay, so still the same yeah. amount. Um, Is that yeah. follower well, we'll, we'll, Spencer? No. <laughs> no, I don't, it's a, it's I don't a have true a, fan. A, a Twitter, uh, so. oh. Shout out to you, <laughs> our only X follower. <laughs> Who is it? Give me their at. Baba. Uh, insectist. Baba. 
at insect yes so shout out to you what up baba thanks for everybody who listens who reaches out to us we really appreciate it so we'll see you in a few weeks and uh yeah as usual how 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 how